This is a really interesting lecture because it's not talking about, you know, a specific clinical condition and a management or an investigation, diagnostic strategies, all of those types of things. This is looking at the idea of these preprint servers that have really exploded, you know, in the last two years with COVID. And prior to that, we have these predatory journals. Ooh, sounds really cool, right? A predatory journal. Arr. So anyways, that's what this lecture is going to be about. I want to clarify and describe this whole phenomenon that's been taking place over the last few years. So the first question is, what is a preprint server? And I like this uh, first question because it talks about med RxIV. And, you know, when, when you've never heard it said out loud, I just always read that as MedRx, right? But apparently it's pronounced MedArchives. I did not know that. So this is the MedArchives server. And it was the initial publication, this preprint server, that published the recovery trial. And remember, that was the first trial that came out on COVID that showed a mortality benefit with dexamethasone. And it was published on a preprint server, not in the traditional publication process. So that was kind of cool. And since then, I was mentioning that earlier, we have 200 publications a day on COVID, and a lot of them are on these preprint servers. So many high-profile studies that we have on COVID went through a preprint server first. And many of you may not have been aware of these types of services prior to COVID taking place. Um, now, it's not in your book, but the preprint server MedRx has a big disclaimer at the start on their website and on every paper they publish on this preprint server. And it says, preprints are preliminary reports of work that have not been certified by peer review. They should not be relied on to guide clinical practice or health-related behavior and should not be reported in the news media, <laughs> thank you, as established information. And what have we seen? Hey, latest paper out says this cures this, right? It hasn't been vetted in the same way that we expect peer review papers to be vetted. So abstract number one is an informational piece it was published in Science, and it talks about the history of preprint servers and goes through some of the pros and cons on this. So um, in physics, they've been doing this for a very long time. So if you're in the world of uh, physics, you would, you would throw something out on a preprint server and see if it's stuck against the wall. And uh, you know, you'd get peers and other people to give you feedback on some preliminary work. See if you're going down the right avenue and have it a sniff test if you will, right? So physics has been doing this for a long time and it's not considered, hey, you couldn't get published in a real journal, right? Which is, tends to be the attitude prior to COVID maybe that, oh, you're on a preprint server. You couldn't find a journal. You couldn't find a home for this paper, right? And that was the attitude prior to this. But can anybody think of any advantages to a preprint server? Any pros that you think of? Come on, we're trying to make this interactive. I'll now pause for an uncomfortably long period of time. Oh, I could do this all day. <laughs> Captain America. <coughs> Nobody can think of an advantage to putting something early on a preprint server. I have a prize in my pocket. Yes, you, sir, in the back. <laughs> you might save a few lives. Yeah, there's a, there's a thought that if the information is true, you've gotten it into the hands of clinicians sooner. Right? So that's one of the potential pros. Also, you can get feedback sooner about, mm, you know, really your methodology or I think your interpretations are not quite up to speed. And so you could refine what you're doing with regards to that. So um, accelerate the, the um, process of getting the information into the hands of other people, getting early feedback. Um, and, you know, it can be a, a spot to challenge the conventional wisdom of the time too. You can say, well, you know, it's not a publication, this is a preprint, let's challenge this dogma maybe, okay? And any cons that you can think of? It goes right back to, you know, your, your response could be wrong, right? It could be incorrect and we could be harming patients. Any other cons? I saw someone in the front row put up their hand. 
yeah, and, and implement something too soon without really good information. Um, there's also a concern that some people could steal your research, right? Steal your research idea and get something done and get it published before you get a chance to publish it once they know about it. Um, it can erode the, the trust in science. What do you mean we're not so sure? Right? And we've seen that even with publications, right? If you look back two years ago and, and look at, oh, you know, the evidence for masks and how that's evolved and the evidence for various other things, treatment strategies for COVID, science changes, right? It's a process, right? But what we thought in March of 2020 is different than what we think in March of 2022 because hopefully we learn from what we've acquired in the research process. And so, you know, it could erode the trust in science because people would, oh, scientists and doctors are changing their minds. Of course we are. You know why? That's how science is supposed to work, right? When we get new information, we should change our mind. Um, some of the other concerns are there's really no peer review involved, so the quality can be questioned. Abstract number two is a more structured description to define this pro, um, process and compare the traditional peer reviews to these preprint publishers and uh, uh, emphasizing, you know, the explosive growth during COVID. So COVID has flooded these preprint servers with information and um, the author's conclusions from this abstract number two is that, you know, preprints are crucial but you need to understand the limitations, right? What you're getting, buyer beware. And remember, you're not paying anything for this. So you get what you pay for. Now, abstract number three is a simple review with a simple um, aim is to identify biomedical preprint platforms, quantify them and compare their key characteristics. So in this study, they identified 44 different platforms. Two thirds of these things were owned by nonprofit academic groups or scientific societies or other funding agencies. And three quarters of them describe a screening process and some basic checks that they do. They check for overt fraud. They check for uh, plagiarism, things like that. The bottom line is that there are many preprint servers now. They have varying policies with regards to quality control, content standards. Um, and there are some potential advantages to these preprint servers and there's some potential disadvantages. But what specific kind of screening do they do? So, you know, when I first started in medicine, um, you know, 30 years ago, I thought, you know what, it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You know, that's a high bar. They must have some great peer reviewers. Oh, I was so naive. Um, you know, just because it's published in a high-impact journal doesn't make it true. And remember, most peer reviewers are not paid to do their peer reviews. And so the emperor has a few clothes on, maybe, but peer, um, the preprint servers have no peer review, so they have no clothes on. Ooh, they're naked. Okay, so they're, they're, it's unvarnished, right? They're just pushing this out, and there's some basic checks that are done. So... Um, don't believe just high impact journals, but also don't bring, believe uh, preprint uh, servers. So abstract number four offers some information and it's particularly about that med archive site and its focus is on the COVID-19 stuff that's been um, published. And the authors in this abstract argue that the use of preprints can lead to occasional problems, you know, but ultimately they think it'll be a positive impact on knowledge translation. I'm a little skeptical. I'm not sure if it'll have a net benefit at the end of the day because I've seen so much of this COVID stuff being pushed through. You know, like there was a lot of stuff published on hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin that came through that, on vitamin D, on other uh, therapies and stuff like that. And people would point to, see, it's been published. Well, it's on a preprint server that didn't have any peer review. All right, so MedRx appears to be a reasonably well-funded um, uh, site, and it was actually a spinoff uh, from one of the BMJ publication uh, or publication groups, um, but there are, are many other preprint servers that are not as well-resourced. And abstract number five tries to identify the variability of preprints. So it looks at uh, the practices uh, that they do, the level of checks that they do, and in this study, they found 57 preprint servers, 
covering, and I have to do this every time I say this statistic, three million, right, Dr. Evil, three million papers. And um, it looked at the research transparency, the integrity checks and stuff, and found that they were rare, right? And so the authors concluded that most of these preprint servers offer little or no guidance on the, in, uh, the issues of transparency and the integrity of the data that's being presented. I kind of think of it's almost like an abstract at a medical meeting. You go to a poster session or an abstract, and it hasn't really been vetted, right? They've put it together that looks like it has, and it's up there, and you go, oh, okay. But it hasn't gone through that quality control process. And I'm not saying that peer review is perfect. Believe me, it isn't. But it is another level of quality control. So I don't think that we should be lowering the bar during a global pandemic. I'm of the position I think we should raise the bar during a global pandemic from what we uh, think works. Uh, and so patients get the best care based on the best evidence. But the preprint servers can serve a purpose of raising awareness. And that gets into the next question. How do preprints affect dissemination? And I've said it before at this conference, it can take greater than 10 years for high quality, clinically relevant information to reach the patient's bedside. The actual paper was 17 years for 14% of the information. So 86% of the information was still not at the patient's bedside once we had high quality information after 17 years. But I just generally say it takes more than 10 years. So we know that there's a knowledge translation gap, a KT window. And so can preprints cut that KT window down? Now, I'm, I'm very involved in social media and have a blog and a podcast, so I think social media can be a powerful tool to do dissemination and cut that KT window down. But can these preprint servers do that? And like I said before, once upon a time, it was, oh, you're on a preprint server, obviously you couldn't get published. You know, sorry, you know, too bad for you. Um, but now, you know, like it's getting much more acceptable that the research goes through a preprint server before it's published in a traditional thing. So the next two abstracts look at this and talk about how it could be potentially very useful. Now, these are only associations, but it seems like the existence of having a preprint preceding your publication by months can improve awareness, can improve um, uh, the attention that your paper gets. And there's a model that's used for emergency medicine, and it's called the leaky pipe model. And that's where it takes that over 10 years for the high quality, clinically relevant information to reach the patient's bedside, the first of the seven leaks in that model is awareness. So if you don't know that dexamethasone can decrease mortality in COVID-19 patients, then you wouldn't know about it and you couldn't implement it, right? So awareness is that first leak. So abstract number six is from Vanderbilt University. The authors used statistical examination of greater than 74,000 peer-reviewed articles to determine if those who had preprints got a higher attention score. And from a social media standpoint, that's called your alt metric score, your alt metric attention score, your AAS. And it's in your journal or it's in your books there that show that little swirly donut with all the colors on it. If you don't have a color copy, but it's called the alt metric score. And they found that if you put your article through a peer reviewed, if you got your article published peer reviewed, but if it was in a preprint first, the alt metric score was about 50% higher and you got 36 more citations from that. So yes, it did raise awareness. Abstract number seven comes out of JAMA, and this is by uh, John Ioannidis, depending on how you say his name. He's the famous meta-researcher from Stanford, and um, it comes uh, to essentially the same conclusion. So this Stanford group looked at 7,700 preprint peer-reviewed articles and examined their altmetric and citation number, and your altmetric score was higher it was about 10 compared to four, and you got more um, citations uh, than if you didn't go through a preprint server. So can you raise awareness by splashing it out there through a preprint server? Yes, you can. Doesn't make the information true though. So bottom line, it seems likely that publishing in a, a, a preprint uh, article has the potential to significantly boost attention, but it remains to be seen whether these practices will be beneficial or ultimately harmful. 
So that covers the preprint stuff. You guys know now about the preprint stuff. So whenever you see a preprint, I just got a tweet before I came up here from a colleague out in Edmonton saying there's a preprint now on vitamin D and COVID, right? And, and it, spoiler alert, good, you're all sitting down. It didn't show significant benefit or superiority to supplementing with vitamin D. But it was on a preprint server I think it was on um, Med Ar uh, Archives, and it'll have that disclaimer. We shouldn't base our clinical judgments on that. However, I start with the null hypothesis that it wouldn't be superior, and as soon as they show me evidence that it is, that's the time to accept the claim. And so um, you'll see these uh, things come out, and you'll see them in s traditional media as well. And you know, you'll be reading online, you'll be reading a reputable newspaper article, and they'll link to an article saying this was published. And what was it? a preprint with a nice big disclaimer up front that said this should not be used to guide clinical um, care. So let's move on to predatory publishing. Now this has been a lot around longer, right? And it's a bit misleading to call these journals because they're not really journals. They're publishing stuff and offering to do this for a fee and nothing else. And so it's a bit misleading to call them journals. And a, abstract number eight is a good primer on this phenomenon. These uh, academics in India describe uh, and clarify what a predatory journal is and the damage that can be done. These things really grew out of the, uh, I mean, there's problems with traditional publishing. They make billions of dollars. And these billions of dollars are made on researchers who aren't paid, right? They may get grant funding and stuff like that, but they, they produce the product, right? They produce the article, the research, and then the peer reviewers at the journal, do they get paid? No, the journals, tr traditional journals don't make a lot of money. I mean, they sell, you know, advertising maybe, or subscriptions and stuff, but it's the publishers of the journals that make all the money. And, and their, their profit margins are more than Google and Apple, actually. So it's a phenomenal uh, business if you want to get into, I guess, as a publisher. Um, but it grew out of this uh, movement to say, listen, why don't we just make these open access journals that we'll publish, but we still have to fund it in some way. So they charge the authors. And it's, you, you may have um, had this uh, opportunity if you've done some research, and they're usually in the order of $1,000, 2000 or $3,000 for you to pay to get your article published in one of these open access journals. Well, these predatory journals came along and said, well, wait a minute, why don't we just charge a lot less, like an order of magnitude less, and not do anything other than put it up there. Unvar like, just there it is. And we'll charge you 150 bucks, and you're published. Okay? And so that's really where it came from, is that the traditional publishing, and then we got open access publishing, which cost, I mean, that's a, you know, $3,000, $2,000 to get published, 150 bucks to get published, a bit different. So predatory publishers are out there. They're a money-making operation. They're masquerading as legitimate journals. Um, and they take your money from the authors, and they do little or no peer review and offer no protection to the readers who are reading these. So what kind of peer review do predatory journals do? And the summary is none. And we have some examples of that. Um, now, preprint servers to compare it to the previous section, they don't charge anything, whereas the predatory journals do. The preprint servers don't do peer review, but they do have a few standards that they go through, right, to make sure that it's not fraudulent material, it, it's not plagiarized material, you know, those types of things. So abstract number nine, oh, was this sneaky. Now maybe you would have liked to have been this person, right? It's an example of how dishonest these, these predatory journals can be and how absurd they can be. So this was a submission to the, quote, International Journal of Advanced Computer Technology. The title of the paper was, Get Me Off Your Effin' Mail-In List. And then they had a couple of figures. It's in there in your notebook. And it shows it's Get Me Off Your Effin' Mailing List. And then in the text, that they submitted for the article, the bulk of the article, was just that same line repeated over and over and over and over again. And then they have that um, graph there 
that shows that scatter graph that says, get me off your effing mailing list. So what was the response that this researcher got? He soon received an acceptance letter. The peer reviewer's report was, this is, quote, excellent. And a request for $150. So that's how absurd the level of peer review on these predatory journals can be. And you'll see many other examples um, that have been published and uh, are known about um, using sort of, you know, uh, the Simpsons characters for all the uh, text in the actual journal submission. Things like that. I mean, did anybody look at it? I don't think so. All right, so bottom line, don't expect any peer review from a predatory journal, and I wouldn't be submitting to these peer reviewed, uh, these um, predatory journals. But can they contaminate the legitimate literature? And it's like, you know, what's the harm? You know, what's the harm? Somebody got, you know, 150 bucks taken, you know, they got this thing. You know, does it matter? And it does matter because this can, this can fuzzy the, the literature base, right? Um, predatory journals are often cited. And abstract number 10 talks about a systematic review and meta-analysis looking into this question. And I mentioned the phenomenon of GIGO. Remember what GIGO stands for? Garbage in, garbage out. This is even worse than garbage, right? This has, you know, like this is crap. Can I say crap? It's being recorded. But this is crap in, crap out. Like this is terrible. So these Canadian epidemiologists looked at um, the inclusion of predatory journals in systematic reviews. And they found in one Cochrane review, so Cochrane has this high level, high standards, they found 8.5% of the citations were from predatory journals. Right? So it can creep in and distort and bias the literature. And when I say bias, it means something that systematically moves us away from the quote-unquote truth. So they conclude that systematic reporting process should be changed to address this issue of predatory journals. Can predatory journals be identified before falling prey to them? And the answer is yes. One of the most powerful tools is just knowing that they exist. Who here doesn't get a solicited email, an unsolicited email? Oh, you know, uh, you are a revered doctor and researcher. Please submit your article to our wonderful journal. You get those, right? It's not just me. Like you get those email requests and asking you to submit those. So if you're aware of these um, predatory journals, you can know about it. Abstract number 11, while methodologically weak, is fascinating because they surveyed a thousand authors who submitted to predatory journals, and you think that they would be like, oh, okay, I got burned, I should know about them now. But the results suggested that most still were unaware that they had submitted to a predatory journal. So I want you to be aware of it, not only if you're a researcher, but you, don't, you can just be a clinician, which is great, but if you're consuming it, be careful. So I'm gonna give you some tips on how to identify those types of predatory journals, because those are the next two papers, and they're probably the best available evidence in dealing with identifying these predators out there. Abstract number 12 is a study examining the attributes of predatory journals on their websites and how to differentiate a predatory journal from a non-predatory journal. And these are the red flags. We, we know about the red flags for back pain. Well, these are the red flags for predatory journals. This was an Ottawa-based research group that were looking at websites and their policies. And they used something called the Beals List, which is a bit controversial, and I'll discuss that next. But that was the gold standard. And they took 100 journals from both predatory and non-predatory journals and said, what was associated, you know, what flag came up more often in the predatory journals. So the first one was, if the scope was rather broad, hmm, that's concerning. If the website contains grammar errors and spelling errors, okay, that might tip you off. It can happen though. If you've got fuzzy images on their website, you know, they don't have high resolution images, you know, it looks like cut and paste time, screenshots, that can tip you off. If they're using something called an index Copernicus value, never heard of it, and apparently it's just a bogus journal ranking metric. If you submit your manuscripts, if your manuscripts are requested to be submitted by email, that can be a tip. And then the other thing is if they're charging a very low amount, 100, 150 bucks, typical open access journals are charging a thousand, two thousand dollars, those types of things. And then look at the email address that it's coming from. 
If it's Yahoo, if it's a Gmail account, it's not some institutional account. Again, now it's not any one thing, but you look at this in its entirety, things are associated with it more likely to be a predatory journal. Now there is a well-known website that's often cited in the literature, and this is by Jeffrey Beals. He came out of the University of Colorado, and he's a librarian there. And he did a lot of research in this area of public, um, or sorry, predatory journals. And he had a blog site, and he created this thing called the Beals List. Now, it was a bit controversial, and the site no longer exists due to threats of lawsuits, you know, for, you know, pointing the finger and say, I think this is a predatory journal. Um, But you can still get access, and we've got links in there that show archives of the list and there'll be printouts in your papers there that show some of the questions and sections that go through to make up this Beals list. But the bottom line is we don't need to go through that. Um, With some background information and knowledge and awareness, um, using some checklists like the Beals list, you can possibly identify some predatory journals. So to uh, complete this, um, key points, preprint servers, they're here, and they're here to stay. They are repositories of unpeer-reviewed information. So buyer beware, be skeptical. Now, preprints have been, quote, indispensable during COVID, like I said, using the recovery trial and the dexamethasone study for rapid dissemination of information. But for all the examples, the few that actually did work, there are many more examples that actually didn't pan out and survive the peer review process. So it does have some big limitations with regards to unreliable dissemination of information. There's a general consensus that they can be a force for good. I'm not in that consensus right now. I'm reserving judgment for now. I'm not sure. Um, And there's lots of preprint servers now, lots and lots. The standards vary widely, like really widely. Um, But, you know, they do gain some attention. There's some buzz. There's some cachet. It's almost like putting out a press release, right? It gets awareness to their research. Um, And then when you look at predatory journals, they're they're a money-making thing. They're not a journal as we would think of it. And they can contaminate the literature and harms legitimate scientific endeavors. Um, And so just be aware of that. And I wouldn't respond to any of those unsolicited emails.